You may not realize that the foundation of our modern internet was developed in 1969 as part of a system called ARPANET. ARPANET was developed by the Department of Defense uh, in order to send transmissions over networks. And the way that it accomplished this was via distance vector routing. Distance vector routing is a simple means of sending packets through a network that only requires a little bit of information about the neighboring nodes of the network. Specifically, if we take a network like this, which has all of the nodes labeled, vertex 1, vertex 2, and so on, then each node only needs to know a little bit of information about its immediate neighbors. So for example, node 1, or vertex 1, only needs some information from vertex 5, vertex 2, and vertex 3. It doesn't have to know anything about the connectivity of the network or about any of these other nodes. So what information does node 1 need? It needs a routing table. So a routing table looks something like this. This routing table tells node 1 all that it needs to know to send a packet to any other node in this network. For example, if the final destination of a packet is node 1, then there is no next node because the packet is already at its final destination. The cost to reach this destination is zero. If the final destination of the packet is node 2, shown here, then node 1 can send the packet directly to node 2 for a cost of 3. Remember that this table belongs exclusively to node 1. Each node in the network has its own table. Now we can go through this and see some things which are not too surprising. For example, to get to node 3, which is here, node 1 can send the packet directly to node 3 for a cost of 4. However, to get to any of the nodes which node 1 is not directly connected to, we have to take a few more steps. So if node 1 wants to send a packet to node 4, shown here, then it will first send that packet to node 5. Every entry in this column must be one of the immediate neighbors of node 1, 5, 2, or 3. The one exception being when it doesn't resend the packet. Now this cost indicates that if node 1 sends a packet to node 5 and then node 5 uses its routing table to somehow get the packet to node 4, the overall cost should be 7. The next row shows that sending directly to node 5 has a cost of 2, and then we have nodes 6 and 7, which once again are not adjacent to node 1. To send to node 6, we first send to node 5, and then 5 somehow gets it to 6, presumably by sending it directly to it, but we don't know that for certain. That is not information that node 1 needs to know. To get the packet to node 7, we will send it to the neighbor node 2. And then from there, it somehow reaches node 7 all the way over here. And the overall cost will be 9. So each node in the network has a table like this and can use it to direct or route a packet to its final destination. However, these values can become outdated, the costs may not always be accurate, which means the choice of where to send each packet could result in network congestion or in lost packets or other problems. So we need an intelligent way of updating these routing tables, and that's what distance vector routing is. Distance vector routing 
is when each of the neighbors of node 1 sends it some information in the form of a vector. Reminder, a vector is simply a list of numbers of a fixed size in this context. Now, specifically, each node will send a copy of its cost column or cost vector, that's this here, to its neighbors. The routing table in node 5 will send its cost column or cost vector to node 1. At the same time, node 1 will send its cost column from its routing table to node 5, 2, and also over here to node 3. Now, when that happens, how do the nodes update their routing tables? They do it like so. So let's assume that we are recalculating the, t the routing table for node 1. So vector 5 has sent a vector of information to node 1. Node 2 has sent a vector of information. And node 3 has sent a vector of information. Let's take a look at what those vectors are. For example, they could look like the following. Here we see a distance vector from each of the neighbors of node 1. There's one from node 2, node 3, and node 5. What is sent is the cost column from each of their corresponding routing tables. Now you'll see that from V2's perspective, the cost to reach V2 is zero. That makes sense because it doesn't have to resend it. The packet has already arrived. Similarly, if I'm sending to three from three, the cost is zero. If I'm sending from five to five, the cost is zero. So the way to read this information is after the packet has already reached this given node, the cost to then reach the given destination is this much more. So these numbers do not account for the cost to initially reach these nodes from node 1. That information is stored locally by v1 uh, and it has some notion of the delay it takes to reach its neighbors. Now this can be very abstract. It could be some sort of measure of the, the delay in terms of the number of packets that are waiting to go to that neighbor. It could be combined with hard-coded information about the distance the neighbors are, or simply the time it takes to get a return signal from the nearest neighbors. But regardless of how we get this information, we assume that it is available to node 1. Specifically, we have a value, which we'll denote with an L, which has two subscripts. This is 1, 2, and I'll assign values here. So the way to interpret this, or the subscripts, is to say the length, in one sense or another, or the delay, from 1 to 2 is 4 and the length or delay from 1 to 3 is 6, and the length or delay from 1 to 5 is 5. Recall that V1 knows this information. These values may change over time, but V1 always has this information, or at least an estimate of it, that it's using to make its decisions. And so how is this information used? Well, V1 wants to send every packet along the most efficient route possible. So if V1 wants to know how long it takes to get, for example, to node 7 via node 2, it would add this 7 to this value 4. Now think about the reasoning behind that. The 4 here is the time it takes to get from node 1 to node 2. So in this network, the cost from here to there is known to node 1 
to be 4, the value that we see here. Now, according to node 2, the cost to get from it to node 7 is 7. So somehow, via a route that we don't need to know, the additional cost to get from here all the way to 7 is 7. So the total cost to get from 1 to 7 via node 2 is 4 plus 7. Hence these values added here and that equals 11. Now we can take this number and add it to all of these values to find out what the overall cost to get from the source of V1 to the destination indicated here via this node. And so I'll fill out those numbers now. So all of these numbers that I've computed are the total cost to reach these destinations starting from V1 if we always send the packet to V2 first. Now, if we send it directly to V2, the only cost is the delay from 1 to 2, which is 4. For all of these other costs, the additional uh, cost we incur is due to the fact that the packet is then forwarded onward to the next node, whatever it may be. We can do a similar calculation for all of these other values. And once we do that, we'll figure out which value goes best in this routing table. First, I'll take this value 6, which is the delay from sending a packet from 1 to 3, and add it to all of these values. Lastly, I'll take this value of 5, which is the delay from node 1 to the neighbor node 5, and add it to all of the values in this distance vector. Now, having computed all of these numbers, we need to figure out how to update this routing table. Now, something worth saying at this point is that the values we are about to put into this routing table do not depend at all on the current values. We can essentially completely cross out all the current values and ignore them because we are going to update and replace them with completely new values based on this information here. The one exception to this is destination 1 because, once again, we are starting at node 1. If we want to send to node 1, then we're already there. We don't need to resend the packet at all. So that will stay the same. And we can essentially ignore that row. The rest of these rows, however, are updated based purely on these values I've calculated. What we're going to do for each row is find the minimal value. So for this row, we have 4, 8, and 7. 4 is the minimum. Here, 5, 6, 12. 5 is the minimum. 7, 9, 9. 7 is the minimum. 8, 12, 5. 5 is the minimum. 7, 8, 8. 7 is the minimum. 11, 8, 10. 8 is the minimum. Now, this example did not have any ties, but if there were ties, we could either break them randomly or we could use some other information to pick the better route. Uh, but for this example, we'll simply assume we have no ties and move on. In each case, I've identified the shortest route or the lowest cost route, and so these minimal costs are the values which will then go into the cost column of our table. Now, as before, we need to fill out the next node column, and the next node will always be a neighboring node of V1, which, once again, from this, we see the neighbors are 5, 2, and 3, which we also knew because those are the sources of these distance vectors. So, in this row, because the lowest cost came from sending to V2, 2 is the next node we will send to. 
here, the lowest cost came from V2 as well, so this will be a 2. Here, the cost of 7 came from sending to V2, so we'll put a 2 here. Then in the next row, the lowest cost results from sending the packet to V5. So we'll put a 5 here. Then we have the lowest cost of 7 to reach node 6 coming from neighbor v2 and then finally the lowest cost to 7 via um, v3 is 8 so 8 is the minimum so 3 goes here. Now we can see that in some cases the value did not change but in other cases it did. However we didn't need to know what the values were before, we updated based purely on the new information. So we can see how changing network conditions can cause these tables to update and hopefully give us more efficient routes. Each time we update we're going to try to get the lowest possible cost and this method does work um, but there are some weaknesses with it, and there are better methods which use a bit more information, which we'll learn about in another video.